Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Kansas and Wichita government and public affairs. We're broadcast on Great Plains Television, that's channel 26.1 on Sundays at in the 8.30 in the morning, repeated at 4.30 in the afternoon, and we have some new channels and new times we broadcast on as well. I don't have them remembered yet, so you'll need to check the website for that. Also, The Voice for Liberty, my site at wichitaliberty.org. You'll find all the old episodes of Wichita Liberty TV there, along with show notes for them and show notes for this episode, and all the other content that I and others create on almost a daily basis. Today, our guest is Matt Kibbe. You may know him from Freedom Works, a national grassroots ad advocacy organization he founded in 2004. He served as president of that until his departure in July 2015. Before Freedom Works, he served as a congressional chief of staff and House Budget Committee associate. He was budget director for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He's author of a few best selling books. One is uh, Give Us Liberty, a Tea Party Manifesto, written with Dick Armey then Hostile Takeover a couple years later, and the most recent one, um, Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff, a Libertarian Manifesto. I have that only on Kindle, so I guess that's a disadvantage. You can't flip up a Kindle book as easily it's hard as to, you have It's hard here. to sign them, too. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you know what? It's hard to sell them on the used market, too. Yeah. Anyway, now Matt has founded uh, Free the People, which is uh, a, a relatively new organization on the web at freethepeople.org. And uh, Matt, uh, welcome to Wichita Liberty TV. Of course, we've got co-host Carl Peter John here. Tell us about Free the People. What is its goal and uh, what's it, what do you want to do with that? So we, we really want to get upstream of politics and I almost call it Grassroots 2.0. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I'm a former Tea Party organizer and, and previous efforts have all been about organize, organizing people that believe in limited government and the values of liberty and cooperation. And I think our biggest failure as, as a broad movement today is that we're not talking to enough people. Technology has opened up this massive marketplace for us. Um, everybody that's on Facebook, everybody at the very long tail, tippy tail of the internet. And I think we're missing an opportunity if we're not trying to speak to that broader audience. And that means you have to tell stories. It means you have to get upstream of politics into popular culture. Because once we're fighting about a candidate, we're pushing people away. Mm -hmm. You're either on team A or team B. But if we're talking about values that, that, that make America the way it is, um, about cooperation and about the pursuit of happiness and, and the beauty of entrepreneurship and creating something no one's ever created before, these are not partisan issues. These are, these are human values from my mm -hmm. perspective. And, and particularly when it comes to young people who are curating their knowledge and their information and their friends and everything else online, we gotta be there. Mm -hmm. So we produce a lot of short videos um, tell stories, and we're we're trying not to be partisan, and I don't I don't consider these values even slightly partisan, mm -hmm. and that's I think that's important. And I think you've talked about in, in some of your videos and the writings about the Republican bucket or the Democratic Party bucket. We got to get away from that, and uh, the parties are so entrenched, though it seems like. Can we? Is that really a realistic goal? Do you think? I call it the the two party duopoly, and mm -hmm. I. I spent a good chunk of my career trying to repopulate the Republican Party with, with people that believed in liberty and constitutionally limited government. But today, it never made sense. And it never made sense for party bosses to decide who our candidates would be without our input. And that was a lot of the Tea Party ethos. We wanted to choose our own candidates that represented our values. But young people today, they've grown up in this, this radically democratized world. Um, they choose everything except when they get to politics. And then they get to presidential politics this last time and they're like, so I have these two choices and I have no idea who decided that for me. And they just, they think it's absurd. And so the registration of young people in particular is independent, but that's a proxy for something that's far uh, more complicated than that. I think, I think we're discovering that for all of the silos that the left creates in terms of identity politics, there's millions and millions of silos. We're all a little bit different. And I think it is important to think about how much things have changed. I think the millennial generation, they were just children, young children when 9-11 happened, for example. I know uh, they threw a telephone book of white pages and yellow pages on my driveway the other day and I thought, 
who uses a telephone book anymore? So that's just a little bit of symptoms of a yeah. few changes, I think. So, yeah. So you think that that Facebook, Twitter, other types of online activists, or is there something beyond Facebook and Twitter that people are using these days? Oh, there is. I mean, my staff is all made up of, of young people, many of whom are under 30, and mm -hmm. I, I joke to them now, by the time you turn 25, you're completely obsolete because <laughs> all of the platforms that you grew up with will be gone the way of the buggy whip. It's still dominated by Facebook and Twitter, mm -hmm. but uh, particularly with young people, Instagram and Snapchat. And what's really interesting is the next generation, because Facebook, for all of its disintermediation, is still top down. Mm -hmm. It's controlled by the gnomes at Facebook headquarters, right. and they, they sometimes censor speech and all that stuff. Um, social media platforms built on blockchain will have no central control. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about sort of a, a dream marketplace the way that classical liberals and, and small government conservatives think about it. We're going to exchange ideas and goods and services and there'll be no middleman. So I think the potential of this to achieve um, the kind of goals that, that we all share is, is we're just scratching the surface. We don't even know quite yet how this is going to go, but I think it's a good thing. I think that's kind of interesting because as Facebook and some of these other digital properties become more important, you start to see politicians are waking up and say, hey, we've let them grow unregulated. Mm -hmm. Now we've got to rein them in a little bit for whether the Russia scandal on Facebook is real or not. Still, that's probably going to provide the wedge that politicians need in order to apply some regulations. So let's take our first commercial break for today on Wichita Liberty TV. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks, co-host Carl Peter John, our guest Matt Kibbe of Free the People. And Carl, I think you had a question. I certainly did because you mentioned opportunities in the digital age, but it's a two-edged sword. And I have just the experience the Tea Party folks had with the IRS that's come back in the news recently. And the fact that privacy that many of us took for granted when I was a young man uh, seems to be obsolete today. And isn't this going to be a challenge both sides, depending upon which way the digital sword happens to be cutting today? Yeah. I, I mean, there is this clash between the incredibly liberating, democratizing aspects of social media and the, the fact that all of those same tools can and will be used by government to control the narrative, to target citizens, to snoop on us, all that stuff. And even Facebook does that. They, they've come to admit that they have been harvesting a lot of data. I, I think that's just the way it is now. Like if, if you want to be um, private in your life and you really want to get off the grid today, it's virtually impossible to do. But you, you can't go on social media. But the fact is the rest of us are there. And we're, we are having these conversations. And I, I think we just get ahead of that. I, you mentioned the IRS scandal and the way that, that Lois Lerner and her cohorts targeted those Tea Party groups. The only reason that they were ever caught is because of social media, because those Tea Party groups could tell their story outside of mainstream media. So the, the upside is the transparency it creates. The downside is, and we've got to be conscious of this, um, governments, the first thing a tyrannical government does today in Ukraine, in, in, in some of these Arab Spring type situations, is they shut down Twitter. Mm -hmm. because they don't like the fact that the people can self-organize. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I say double down on those tools. but Because I, the status in an Orwellian sense, they're able to do things that Stalin and Mao could have only, and Hitler could have only dreamed of. Yeah. And, but again, that's, that's like, that's, it's happening whether we like it or not. It's kind of the new political gravity. And the question is, do we, do we sort of protest against that or do we figure out a better way for the forces of, of liberty and transparency to call out governments when they do these things? I think there's, I think you see again and again and again, um, it, let me give you a specific example, Venezuela. Venezuela has had this massive uprising against an increasing, increasingly oppressive socialist regime. The size of those protests and the fact 
that you can watch endless videos on YouTube showing the most, the most brutal, violent um, tactics used by the government against their people. Um, compare that to Mao's Great Leap Forward. He ended up murdering 45 million people. Most of the world did not know for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know today. Or about um, Stalin having, uh, making a famine in the Ukraine and the New York Times thought Stalin right. was a great guy, but now we know, no, that wasn't well, true Well, Walter Durante received right. a Pulitzer Prize for his fake news in the 1930s about was, the Ukraine. Yeah, we've all read these stories and he was FDR's advisor and the only story that Americans got about Stalin was through that New York Times, which was fundamentally corrupted. Mm -hmm. um, that guy would not get away with it today. The New York Times does not get away with that today the way they did that. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, because from talking about examples in journalism, we've got young people who seem to be really attracted to collectivist status solutions. And I view it as partly our age where we don't have, I, I would culturally, there are no heroes. We're tearing down icons as we speak. Now, some of them, if it's a Confederate general, that's one thing. But I saw a, a story about we're going to tear down Abraham Lincoln because he owned slaves, which, of course, is a historic um, inaccuracy. But in this day and age, I feel it. So it must, you know, my emotions are paramount. And how do we get past past this in, 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 our, uh, in our environment where politics seems to be everywhere and everything? Yeah, I mean, you've, we've all seen these polls about, about young people being romanced by socialism, and, and Bernie, of course, rebranded it. It's democratic socialism now. I don't know what that is. It seems like a contradiction in terms. But when you, when you dig into, um, and the Reason Foundation does some really interesting polling on this subject, um, when you start to ask young people what they mean when they say socialism, it has absolutely nothing to do with what we understand socialism to be. Socialism is a very top-down and, and ultimately a brutally violent way of forcing people to do something they wouldn't do otherwise. And the, the, the results are playing out before our eyes in Venezuela. But we, when young people hear that phrase, they think, they think about people working together at the local level to solve problems cooperatively. And I'm thinking to myself, no, that's, that's us. This is what we believe. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with socialism. So I think instead of scolding young people, I think, I think we have to have that conversation. Because you go on, it's the same polling that I'm citing goes on to say, so do you believe that the government should own the means of production? And they're like, heck no, that's a stupid idea. Do you want the government to own so Uber or Amazon? There's confusion, example? it's all about, it, there's confused language here. And you know they talk about the sharing economy, but you know Uber is not just part of the sharing economy. It's a brutally efficient way to allocate scarce resources. Yeah, hold on to that idea, Matt, and we're going to uh, explore that a little bit more in just a moment when we come back from another break on Wichita Liberty TV. Well, welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV again. I'm Bob Weeks, co-host Carl Peters, on our special guest, Matt Kibbe of Free the People. So it seems like you see some polling also that people are skeptical of government, yet they look to government for solutions. For, for example, just this week, our president uh, wants to ramp up the war on drugs in response to this opioid crisis, which is a severe problem. I mean, people are dying right and left. So I did some research. There was an article early this year from the Journal of Pain Management. It was, I think it's a peer-reviewed scholarly journal. It concludes fewer patients are being prescribed opioids. The amounts prescribed are less. The daily doses are less. And there is a national emphasis on non-opioid treatment alternatives. In conclusion, public health policies and, act and actions have resulted in decreased utilization of prescription opioids. That's been going on for about five years, I think. It said, yeah, more and more people are dying every year from opioid overdose at the time the government wants to even ramp up the war on drugs. How does that make any sense at all? Well, I think part of it is is actually the war on drugs and, and President Trump wanting to essentially expand the war on drugs to take on opioids. We've seen throughout American history that these 
these good intention policies actually lead to the opposite result. And I happen to be friends with a number of uh, chronic pain sufferers. A friend of mine, Christine, has uh, struggled with the, the, the results of a benign brain tumor most of her life. And until, and she was on opioids, they all have an opioid story and they can tell you some fairly devastating stories about long-term opioid use. Um, they've tried medical cannabis mm -hmm. and, and, and we've, we haven't allowed that until recently and, and my friend lives in Utah and she, she breaks the law every time she does that. Um, my suggestion would be less regulation and more, more liberty because opioids serve a very important function. A lot of people get, get, get relief and hard to overdose from marijuana. I mean, I'm not a user, so I yeah. don't really know, but it's either difficult or impossible, I think. I think the net number of people, the gross number of people that have died from marijuana use is zero. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, there's a lot of scare stories about this stuff, but I think, I think the, uh, the government involvement in the, the war on drugs has been a categorical disaster. The same way when we banned alcohol, you created all these perverse outcomes and, and, and violent gangs mm -hmm. and, and bootleg liquor that killed people. I'd rather to bring it all out and, and not judge people so much, but, but let's, let's focus on public safety and not our opinion about whether our neighbors should, should be using medical cannabis. Because a lot of the times the problem are not that the drugs are actually harmful themselves, although some are very harmful. I'm not advocating their use, but people struggle because in order to feed their addiction, they have to become criminals. Yeah, yeah, and you know, one of the one of the lesser told stories is um, veterans. They come back from war and mm -hmm. and um, they get hooked on opioids, and then they're cut loose, and and all of a sudden they do become criminals. And once you get an arrest on your record. It's hard to get a job, right? Um, and and it this feeds the the mass incarceration that we're seeing in our prisons. So I think I think a more rational drug policy. I'm disappointed that that President Trump has gone this way because he he said some fairly thoughtful things about medical cannabis um, when he was a candidate. And but the Attorney General Sessions is just he really wants to ramp up the war on marijuana and everything. So. He's, he's a very 19th century attorney <laughs> general. And yeah, he said that good people don't smoke marijuana. And, uh, and I have offered publicly, I'd, I'd love to put together a contingent of, of patients who use this. We, we actually produced a, a number of videos about this and everything from, from seizures to, to chronic neck pain to things that, that turn people from bedridden, unproductive to productive citizens. I don't know why anyone would say no to that. I don't, right. I don't get that. Yeah, and you know, in Kansas, we don't even have medical marijuana. It seems like we're a long ways from that in Kansas because we know legislators, I won't name them, who said, we'd rather build more prisons than have let people use medical marijuana. So yeah. we're pretty far away yeah. uh, from that. Uh, Carl, did you have a remark there? Or? Well, I was going to ask, we've had a lot of discussion about Obamacare in general. Um, has, does, do you see that having any impact on the opioid crisis, either positively or negatively? Because of Medicaid expansion, Kansas is one of the states that hasn't had it. We haven't had the opioid problem, but I've heard conflicting reasons why it hasn't been as severe here as it has been in other parts of the country. Yeah, there was a, a recent um, essay by a doctor named Jeffrey Singer. Maybe you guys know Jeffrey. He's a Cato, Cato. adjunct mm -hmm. scholar, and he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a doctor. And he would argue that the opioid crisis is wildly exaggerated. And, and it's definitely dangerous, and, and people are definitely getting in trouble. But the context of its use in, in proper medical um, circumstances is, is essential. And, and we, we, once we make things illegal, um, you will get um, bootleg Bad, you're buying dangerous. from sellers yeah. who have no reputation to right. protect, and therefore their product could be, you know, way out of bounds as far as the strength or other thing adulterated in there, and that's what leads to problems. So we don't have that problem. I, I listened to his podcast just the other day. You don't have that problem with like whiskey because you go to the store and it says 80 proof, and you know it's going to be pretty close to that. Otherwise, right. the reputation of the uh, distiller will suffer. Plus, you have recourse if, if you can sue people, but you can't sue your your crack dealer or your meth dealer or whatever either. So, Matt, one more commercial break this week on Wichita Liberty TV, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back to our last segment of Wichita Liberty TV t for today. I'm Bob Weeks, co-host Carl Peter John, special guest Matt Kibbe of Free the People. And Matt, um, your most recent book was titled um, Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff. I think that's a distillation of the libertarian non-aggression axiom. I know David Bo says don't hit people, don't hurt people, pretty much the same thing. And in that book, you, um, well, what's curious about libertarians is we, and most people would say, yeah, you can't hit people, you can't steal from them. Libertarians are curious because we insist on applying that to government as well. You wrote, it seems to me that stealing is always wrong and that you can't outsource stealing to a third party like a congressman and expect to feel any better about your actions. A lot of people don't think that makes any sense at all. Yeah, and it's, it's funny because the, the thing that holds civil society together is, is what we do voluntarily, the values that we share as a community, um, and those didn't come from government. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the idea that we would use government to solve social problems that say our neighbor's in trouble, mm -hmm. and you're, you, you almost develop a, a rationale for not taking responsibility for, for helping up people in your own community because you're like, I already paid. I paid in Washington. There's let, a government let them program fix this for problem. that. Yeah. So it becomes an excuse not to take responsibility, but I, I don't. I, I don't understand, particularly when it comes to, you know, there's a, there's some basic functions that that most Americans would agree the government should do, and after that we fight like cats and dogs about all that stuff. Like, mm -hmm. Should the government involved in drug policy? Is mass incarceration a good thing? Should we be providing free health care to people? We don't One agree of the most on those important things. things, like schools, educating young people, we fight hard like that over schooling, and that should be something we cooperate and celebrate instead of fighting. But Bob, the question is, who decides within, if we say it's a government function, should it be a local government function, state, federal, and we've got kind of a mishmash hybrid at the moment and at the moment here in Kansas it's a uh, uh, Kansas Supreme Court setting state spending policy which is the bulk of the revenue that's being spent by the 280 some school districts in this state. But if you were to say education is not a government function people would look at you like oh don't you want people to read? That's that's the standard response and we struggle with that and, it, and I do think that that people that are for an expansive government should be forced to go through the exercise of actually going to their neighbor's house and, and with a gun at their side. They don't have to pull it as long as the neighbor will comply, mm -hmm. but they need to understand that, that this is a form of theft, particularly when you get into the government doing everything. And you know, the other dirty secret is that whatever your intentions are, you want the government to provide heat, free health care so that everybody, every Medicaid recipient gets free health care. But the real recipient is some corporation, is some middleman, is somebody with a seat of power in Washington that's skimming all of the cream off of these programs. And by the time it gets to a Medicaid patient, you're standing in line. You're waiting for lousy service. But here's the, the it's worse than that, Matt, because at the, as a local fish, official, we had a lot of grant programs. Some of them were state grant programs. Some of them were federal grant programs. Some of them were federal pass-through programs administered by the state. So the, the Topeka or Washington would say, we're doing something, but it's actually the local government that was actually where the rubber met the road in terms of this grant program, whatever it might be, whether it was a health department, whether it was um, related to uh, addiction problems or whatever we happen to be dealing with. So it's, it's the complicated nature of it and we've moved away. You talked about the voluntary cooperation. That was the big takeaway from de Tocqueville and Democracy in America, that voluntary cooperation, he was stunned by it, but it was the decentralization of power and decision making and we've moved away from it as a local official. I don't know how many times I felt like we'd have a discussion, but our hands were tied because the criteria was being determined by other levels of government and even if we decided it was a, a problem and it was something we should be, do, be, be doing locally, we, we struggled with that and I don't know how you get out of this uh, uh, lack of accountability because lack of accountability, you talk about responsibility in here, yeah. if there's no one responsible and the buck always passes here, uh, we're just in for a, we're cruising for a bruising. It's always the dilemma 
for libertarians and, and limited government advocates is the other side can always offer up a program. We'll spend money on this. And it's always an empty promise, but it sounds better than, than perhaps our answer of, you know what, the market's going to figure this out. So I think, I think our challenge is, is to get beyond, you know, libertarians are generally raging against the machine and we have this moral outrage about horrible things that governments have done and misallocation of resources and leaving children behind in our education system. We don't really talk about the beauty of, of liberty that much. We don't talk about how awesome it is that you can start up a, a nano craft brewery in this country and make something that no one's ever made before and do it just because you wanted to. You didn't have to get anybody's permission. You didn't have to get approval from the government, although you do with, with the production of beer. Um, we don't talk about the awesome pursuit of happiness that only happens when people are free. And so part of what we're trying to do at Free the People is, is tell those stories, those beautiful stories of people who can only thrive because they're free to do so. And we gotta do more of that because we spend all of our time raging against um, big government and, and we should, we're, we're right to do that. But we don't, we don't have that, that positive vision, I think, that the left gets away with with their empty promises. And I think that's important because oftentimes people say, Bob, you're just against everything. What are you for? Well, I'm not for a government plan, but I'm for people doing like what you talked about there. So I, I really appreciate that, Matt. That's at freethepeople.org. The video and other things like that, I think, are, are very helpful. So we're out of time today. So Matt Kibbe, thanks very much for stopping by. Carl, thank you for your input. We'll see you next week on another episode of Wichita Liberty TV.